All right, folks, welcome to the Taking the Lid Off podcast. I'm going to read you a little excerpt here. The first 24 hours went mostly as planned. My training begins on Wednesday, so my plan going into this trip was to have two days to get acclimated to the area. I wanted to get the feel of the ground, get climatized, and brush up on my language and settle into my room so I could check out some routes. Having traveled around Japan many times, I knew the transportation system could be intimidating. While I did some map study, there's always something about getting the real-time feel of an area, the nuances, people, patterns, necessary sites, and movement times between locations. On my map, I had some triangles to represent the various dojos and equipment shops I'll be visiting. I spent the first day checking out the best routes, quickest lease transfers, and the ones that hit multiple points. I've often reminded myself and the soldiers that I've led to consider the importance of reputation. So being on time, ready to train, and a proper attitude are elements of the reputation I want to forge with the folks I will be interacting with at the dojo. So attitude is everything to me. In my quiet time, navigating the chaos of Tokyo, I reflected on attitude. While the complexity of the railway system offers a picture of chaos, the truth of the matter is that chaos can be present internally and externally. In the realm of the internal chaos, it could manifest as being amped up, fear, anxiety, lack of confidence, or other means. So another reason to establish a baseline up front for me is to help gain some familiarity. Later, when Murphy shows up, there will likely be less chaos and crisis needing my attention. A clear mind lends to a better focus on the task at hand. I believe that and want to go into the dojo with that mindset. Skipping ahead. My first training session was everything I envisioned and then some. The training also provided me some expectations and potential into regards to my development professionally, personally, and academically. Before I get into some of the details, I feel it is essential to share the road to this dojo. I visited several dojos over the past two days, and I had well over 20 leads and rank ordered them based on the reputation, reviews, and the number of training days during the week. On one occasion, I was rejected to train at a major dojo after introducing myself. My Japanese is good enough that I can pick up certain phrases, and combined with the body of mannerisms, I sensed an unfavorable view to my request. It was similar to other types, of endeavors when one steps into another unit or organization and you get the vibe that this is not going to go well. That dojo was not at the top of my list, so I moved on. I went back to my top choice last night, determined to train. I stopped by the dojo several days prior, but got no response when I rang the bell on that occasion. I had sent them three emails previously with no response and was starting to have my doubts if this dojo was going to work out. I'm glad I returned. I showed up an hour and ahead of their published time for Wednesday training. This time when I rang the bell, an elderly man responded from a second story window. I stood on the street, bowed, introduced myself, and explained why I was there. He spoke decent English and told me to come back in an hour and a half. Here we go again was the first thought that entered my mind. Before this gentleman closed the window, I asked if it would be okay to wait on the bench outside of his dojo. He responded with a nod and a verbal, hi. It was cold, and I found myself thinking back to a training event some 29 years prior where a team of students I was with had to deal with a guerrilla chief to enter his base. That was the final exercise prior to becoming a Special Forces soldier. Rapport building one-on-one -on -one was about to play out, and I wouldn't want it any other way. The elderly man eventually came down, opened the door, and invited me in. He questioned me some more about my knowledge of kendo. I could tell he was somewhat amused that I had no background in kendo and traveled from the States determined to learn. I listened to him intently as he shared me the story of his dojo, how he'd been practicing since the age of three. I had never asked him if he was the sensei, but I assumed he was a sensei, so to make sure, I asked if he was the Kubo sensei, to which he acknowledged he was know your target audience and with that we have mr retired sergeant major pat fensom 
back with us. And that reading is from his blog, The White Belt Mindset. And what we're going to talk about with Pat today is his transition from military service to civilian life. And I skipped around on that blog. I highly encourage you to go read it. I'm going to have the uh, links in the show notes and in the comments for uh, social media. So I, I highly recommend that you go read the blog and, and hit all the points. There's some good points in there that I missed, but I wanted to skip around and, and make sure I got some, some good stuff across to, to rope you into the show with what we're about to talk about. So Pat, welcome back. Thanks, Chad. Good to be back with you guys. So that was a super interesting uh, portion of your transition story, but I want to take it back. So if you haven't listened to about who Pat is and everything, I suggest you go back uh, some episodes and find the first episode with Pat and also the second episode. Listen to those if you want to know more about Pat. But for now, we're going to get into the transition stuff. So Pat, what, what led you to decide to retire from the military? Uh, several factors, Chad, that led me to retire. Um, often heard from professionals or read about, you know, various professionals talking about the transition process from their given profession. And they would also often mention the fact that you just know when. And so, uh, you know, we, we talked about 3rd Battalion, the assignment where you and I came to uh, know each other. Uh, a couple episodes ago, I knew about that time that it was likely my last assignment, though I kept an open mind. Uh, I was going to be at 31 years by the time I finished, you know, my time in the Army. So some of it was, hey, I'm, I've been wearing this uniform for 31 years. It is time to transition. There's some aspects of your body tells you when, you know, I didn't want to just hang around uh, getting a paycheck or, you know, taking a position. I want to be able to still compete or, um, you know, take part in activities with, you know, with the, with the folks in the, in the unit. So a lot of the factors, and, and I just knew when. So, you know, that, that was the main uh, driving, for, driving force to me deciding to retire. So you more or less felt it. You you felt like it was time. It was time. Yeah. I haven't really talked about it on here, but my decision to retire was was kind of the same thing. Um, but it was also the fact that once I made E8, uh, once I made Master Sergeant, even though I really enjoyed the job, that was when I was working there at 3rd Battalion and became Chief Instructor um, and then a First Sergeant. I, I enjoyed those jobs, but I also knew that that was kind of the end for me because once I – started to get further away from the troops, you know, and, and, and if you, it's hard to explain, but if you understand that, I mean, you know, you get up more of those staff positions and the levels where you're going to be part of staff. Uh, that's kind of when I knew I, I was like, yeah, it's not really what I came, came for, uh, while I enjoy it. And, and I think I can do well at it. I knew it was, was kind of the time for me. And there were several other, other factors, but I did just feel like it was, it was time. I like um, to also point out, you know, in fact, from, from my perspective, my experiences, um, when I left, I left at a point where I felt like uh, I was at the top of my game. It was on my terms. And so certainly with any profession, you, you, don't, you don't go into a job, want to transition, retire, you know, get, move on to the next, another position on somebody else's terms. So if, if you could control those terms or they're under your terms, that's the ideal process. And that's exactly what I experienced. I just knew when. And, you know, for the listeners out there, there's nothing wrong with that. We all transition. And so embrace that process. Um, but the benefit I had is um, the benefit I had was that I thought I was top of my game and it was on my conditions. So for the listeners... <laughs> I want you to listen to this and hear the stories and enjoy the stories. But I, if you're somebody that's in the military now, currently thinking about transition, or if you're already in the process, or if you've transitioned to civilian life already, I want you to hear some of the lessons 
um, and, and take them and, and try to gather something from this as well, other than just hearing, hearing the stories. So you've made the decision to retire. What was the prep like? So what, what did you start doing in preparation uh, for retirement? For me, the preparation um, did occur. Hey, I made a decision. I'm going to retire and I start prepping. You know, as I look back, there was aspects of my development, professional development, and knowing that I was eventually going to retire, what did I want to do? Who did I want to be? What did I want to continue? All those things, you know, circulated in my head off and on, uh, sometimes during PT, sometimes my quiet time. And there's some of that that I wrote down in a journal. So I had started thinking about this. But once I retired, I had a no kidding, okay, there's going to be an end date to this. So what? What's that going to look like? My approach to that, Chad, uh, keep in mind, you know, we, we, you and I and, and a lot of folks out there that serve time in the military have learned a lot of skills, whether it's planning, uh, decision making. So I decided to tap into some of, the, some of those aspects that I've learned over the years. So I came up with a PACE plan, PACE, primary, alternate, contingency, emergency. We often utilize that when we plan things, um, you know, in case something happens, we go to the next level. Well, my PACE plan was based on my experiences, my desires, um, what are, what's the primary thing I feel I could do? What's the alternate contingency? And so I rank and stacked those areas. So as a retired command sergeant major, the time I spent in the military, it would be easy for me to transition to a government job, working at the Special Warfare Center as an example, or working for the Army in some capacity as a government employee. That was gonna be an easy transition. So that was number one on, on the list. And I rank and stack all the way down to, you know, what is the hardest thing for me in that rank and stack? And that would be to be a business owner because I had no experience in that. So once I rank and stacked all of those, I flipped it because my approach for me was that I wanted a challenge. So I took what was on the bottom of my list and put on number one. And I just thought about what would that would look like. And that's what I kind of pursued since um, retiring. I'm not saying that that's the technique everybody needs to follow. That's the technique I utilize. Nothing wrong with going, you know, into a government job if that's what you want to do. But for me, there was the aspect of I wanted a challenge. I wanted to grow. I wanted to explore things. And so taking what was on the bottom of my list, putting it on the top of my list was something that I could pursue. Yeah. So one thing that I run into a lot is it's interesting what you said, using a pace plan, all that made me think, um, one of the things that I run into is guys say, man, I, I don't know how to do this. I don't know what I'm doing. And, and my thought is, and I, and I had that thought as well at times, but reflecting, I tell people, I'm like, no, you, you do know how to do this. Okay. Now, now I understand if you're a, if you're a person that's been in the military three, four years and you're getting out, you, you probably don't have the planning skills and probably didn't learn quite as much when it comes to planning and execution and all those kind of things, or maybe you did, but if you're a retiree, especially you do know how to do this. You can take the skills that you learned in the military with, with uh, respect to planning, organization, all those kinds of things. And you can absolutely apply that to your retirement process, your job finding process, all those kinds of things. So, so don't think that you don't have the tools. You do have them. I think sometimes guys just get caught up in, there's a process for everything in the military. And now they think they should have a process specifically for, for retirement and all that. And, and it's not always the case. So take the processes that you know and apply them to your, uh, to your retirement. It may not be easy and it may not be step-by-step step as we experienced it in the military, but I think the models there, and I think there's some experiences 
in applying that model from our military background that helps us to plan or foresee certain things and, and you know, goal set, uh, drop a map. And again, we all know uh, a good plan doesn't survive its first contact. Well, guess what? That may be true in our transition process. Come up with a plan. And the first time you sit down with a uh, employer or you're at an interview, it may not go well. But guess what? That's life. And so um, there, I agree with you, Chad. There's a lot of lessons that if we think about it that is applicable both from our military careers and that will help us in this transition and even further. Yeah, and and the perfect example, one of the things you just said, no plan survives first contact. We all know that. I mean, even the, like, a, like I mentioned before, a guy's only been three or four years. That's something that they that they do know or should know. Uh, yeah. If you've been in any kind of contact before, you know that that's absolutely true. Uh, you know, the other thing we say is the enemy always has a vote in your plan, right? So, right. Um, so yeah, so you've got all these tools and lessons that you've learned from the military. You just gotta, you just gotta tweak and and apply them to this. So, you started the retirement process. How did the retirement process go for you? It was, uh, it was interesting. Even though I had you know, conducted some mental repetitions. I had spoken to several folks, friends. I embraced the process in that I took part in the classes. You know, one aspect was I was a command sergeant major, so I wanted to know what my soldiers were going through. But two, I had been in positions where I was on the receiving end of a lot of things, interviews. I would interview people. But that transition process when I had to go through some role playing where I was the one being interviewed, that was valuable experience for me, at least to start thinking about, okay, you know what, I need to change these aspects of my presentation. I need to look at how I present myself both verbally and non-verbally. So I took part in a lot of classes. Um, when people ask me, what you would tell others in helping you transition? What would be the main thing? And the you know, first thing that pops in my mind, Chad, and, and I want to share with your listeners, is I had to learn to get away from the identity of being a command sergeant major. From my time as first sergeant and following positions, um, I was used to being addressed in a professional manner. I, I was okay with Pat, but because of the rank, people address me, command sergeant major, all this. And so over time, when you hear that, you kind of get used to it. And I was going to go back into a world where the command sergeant major didn't mean anything. And I had to understand that mentally and accept that. So one thing I did is I asked people to call me Pat. Now, I get it. In the military discipline and all that, that's not the right answer for a lot of people. But I was also working in an environment where at times we did go by first name basis. And I had enough professionals around me, like you and the other first sergeants, that knew at certain times they needed to call me Command Sergeant Major. But in my office area, going out in PT, it was okay to call me PAC. I needed to hear Pat more versus CSM to help me transition mentally and embrace the fact that, you know what, Command Sergeant Major does not define me. My desire to grow and learn and pursue something else, that character, all those things, that's what defines me or that's what should define me more than a rank or position. And so embracing that process was huge for me. So I think to draw on what you said there with having people address you as Pat and everything, I sometimes feel sorry for guys that I, I started my career in the 82nd Airborne Division, got the, the stuff back here, and then switched over to special operations. And I sometimes feel bad for folks that come straight out of retire from an environment like the 82nd where they are so structured and so 
you know, formal and everything, and then step into civilian life, because I think special operations was a benefit for me. And I'm, I'm sure most people stepping into the civilian world, because it is a more relaxed environment in special operations, whereas you call each other by first names at times when it's appropriate. Uh, you treat each other more like professionals in a special operations environment than in a place like the 82nd where it's just super strict uh, most units in the conventional army. And, and so I, I think there's a benefit to coming out of special operations into the civilian world. And then, you know, the, the, the process itself, look, I hope people understand the, the military's retirement process is not what I would consider great as far as preparing you for civilian life. But I'm also of the mindset that you need to prepare your own self anyway. Nobody's going to take care of you, but you. And and when you step outside of the military, you're now, I mean, hey, whatever, see ya. I mean, the world keeps going. The military keeps going. Uh, you're now an afterthought. So you got to take care of you. And so that's another thing in the military. You know, you have this support structure around you. And especially as a command sergeant major or first sergeant or whatever, you've got all these people that help you do things and whatnot and help you accomplish your mission. Now it's just you, you know? So, so I, I think, and, and, and on the retirement process too, if it was up to me, I would have guys start kind of the retirement process once they go, once they hit, say, 10 years in the, in the army, I know you become indefinite at 10 years, which I won't get into all that. But I would say basically when you hit about 10 years, if you know you're going to stay till retirement or even if you're not, you should start planning for what that next chapter is because it can take quite a while to figure things out. Uh, get some certifications and training in place to set you up for success. It's, it's a, it's a process that could use some improvement from the military standpoint. But like I also said, I, I'm, I'm not real sure that I believe that they owe you that where a lot of people think the military owes you to be trained for civilian life. Eh, it's a bonus that they do give you some training, but I, I think it's a bad mindset to think, well, the military didn't teach me this the military didn't teach me that to get ready for civilian life. Well, and you got to close that gap. Right. I think too, Chad, <clears throat> to add to that, you know, when, when, when you enter that transition process and you're eligible two years out, a lot of folks may do at that point, uh, maybe a year out. And it really depends on a lot, you know, what's going on in the unit. Um, you know, when I was a command sergeant major, I could have started two years out. But my mindset was, I'm not going to cheat you guys and take time away. And I think that's a lot of the mindset of a lot of folks, and I get it. Um, but at the same time, you got to own your process. I had a luxury of once I was replaced, I had about six months to just do transition. And so for me, and I think a lot of folks, it's a lot of stuff going on at one time. You have to make all those classes. You have to deal with your medical stuff. You're thinking about your job. You're thinking about resumes. You're thinking about moving. All of these things, you know, come come at you all at once. That's why there's some there, there's a buffer window there for you to help plan. Maybe take that in phases would be my you know lessons learned that I, I would tell a, a a person that's thinking about transitioning. Um, because again, there's a lot of aspects and they all matter to some degree. And I agree with you. I, I don't know that I feel that the military owes you. There's a lot of programs out there. And I think the transition process exposes you to those programs. Even with that, you have to take, take that baton and take it to the next level. Investigate. Does this fit me? Does the insurance plan life insurance, medical plan, does that fit me and my family's needs? You gotta look into that. And then, you know, there's a lot of experience out there. You know, you're gonna leave the, uh, um, your viewers and your listeners, um, my contact information. I'd be more than glad for somebody to contact me and say, hey, can you, can you 
talk me through this process, your experiences. I'd be more than glad to, to mentor a young person through this process and uh, share, with, share with them my lessons learned. Uh, and, and that offer is always open with, with me as well, which is kind of why I do this, this podcast and do talk about transition with folks because I think we've all learned lessons, much like any process. You can, you know, hindsight's twenty twenty. You look back and you think, what could I have done better? So I would encourage anyone to reach out to me, reach out to Pat or, or anyone that has done it before um, to help you with, with the process. I usually tell people, I usually give people a few things when they, when they ask me about it. I'm like, okay, generally, here's my advice. Get started early, okay? It's not going to be easy, so you got to put in a good bit of effort and then take all the training that's offered to you. I took all the retirement classes that you have to take. I took the entrepreneur class. Uh, I think it was called entrepreneur class. It was like uh, boots to something. I, I can't remember, but... Um, and then I, I even took a class where I learned how to use Intuit QuickBooks and got a free copy of Intuit QuickBooks. I was like, well, I don't know, maybe I'll have a business, you know? So, right. um, so I, I took advantage. So take advantage of all the programs. Some are good, some are not as good, but you can take something away. If you're really trying, you can take something away from, from any of those programs. So you got the retirement process. Your uniform is now off. You've done your, you know, you've hit your retirement date. You're now officially out of the army. What what happened at that point? How how are things going then? It was it, it was very very interesting for me. I had a mindset going in. I think it was even in the first week. Might have been a couple of days after I officially came off the books of being a soldier in, in the active army. I got up early in the morning. And I went and did PT. And that was the last time I got up early in the morning to do PT. And when I say early, I'm talking between 5 and 5.30. Cause I, you know, after I got done, I said, well, why am I doing this? And it was that mindset. I still had to prove to people that I'm able. And then I was kidding myself because nobody cared. And so once I got that in my head, I, I went back to my, my, my planning, you know, my plans. And um, I say, you know, this is what I need to really focus on. Not trying to boost my ego or prove to other people. Uh, I need to prove to other people and prove to myself in this new direction I'm going. So what I did, Chad, is I wanted to um, continue development in something that I'm very passionate about, and that's mental conditioning. And, you know, I got involved with... Um, you know, what most people understand are, are sports psychs. We call them performance consultants or performance coaches in the military. I got involved with them uh, it, during my military career and it really fascinated me that uh, mental readiness, the mental psychology, uh, taking things from good to great, um, being combat focused. I, I, I did some gigs with uh, professional sports teams where I got to talk about a soldier's approach to being, you know, combat-minded, um, focused in, in, a, in, a, in the combat zone. And so all those experiences really feel a passion in me. So I became uh, a student, a uh, full-time student in a master's program, um, looking to uh, complete performance psychology. I'm two classes away from that, and I'll be done by the end of June. But that's been a two-year process. Yeah. So I know you've been working hard on that. So what, what, what was it? I mean, what was it like emotionally? How are how are you doing as far as stepping out of the uniform? You're not going into MPT anymore. You don't have anybody calling your sergeant major. You don't, you know, you don't have the the guys around, so to speak. What was that? How did that feel? There was there was highs and lows. To be honest with you, Chad, I miss that camaraderie. People ask me, what do you miss about the military? I miss the people. I miss the interactions. I still have those to a lesser degree. I'm still engaging with folks that I served with, but I'm also engaging with folks that are outside the military, my classmates in this course, other professionals outside of the military. So I, I, I'm building a network. It's not that I left my military network aside, I still engage them because it, it brings 
value to my life and hopefully I'm bringing value to their life, but it's at a different pace. My primary requirement or, or, or duty was doing classwork. I was pretty good at um, meeting suspenses. So when I had assignments to do, I could meet those and you know, I never been late on the assignment. So, the, but the pace was different. Uh, instead of doing PT early in the morning, I started enjoying doing PT mid-morning, mid-afternoon, um, because I knew my investment into the physical fitness aspect was not to be on an ODA or pass a PT test or compete with you guys. It was more, at this point, maintaining physical fitness for my health, maintaining physical fitness because I want to be a presenter. And I don't, personally, I don't want to be a presenter where I'm talking about my experiences in the military and I'm uh, fat and heavy because I feel that's a poor representation and takes away from the message. So those are the things that drive me now in the physical fitness aspect. But definitely pace was different. I had a lot of pleasure in not dealing with a lot of the bureaucracy that I experienced in the military. So that weight was off my shoulders. And, you know, I would go to post every once in a while because I still taught on a part-time basis some courses. And, I, you know, folks would come up to me and say, hey, you were a command sergeant major. I said, yes, yes, I was. And then they would make comments like, you, you seem much more relaxed. I always thought I was relaxed in that position. I would ask my wife and I would ask some close friends, Am I different now? And then they, they would say, you know, you were very intense back then. I said, okay, intense. What what did that look like? Oh, you were very focused at times. Okay. Well, you know, now that I don't have that pressure or have a lot of things going in my mind from making this happen, following up on this requirement, holding somebody accountable, going to a meeting, all that. You know, it came off my plate and it really became, okay, my honeydew list, my class requirements, some of the things I was personally pursuing, and, and, and I was able to embrace that. I loved it, man. I love being retired. I do miss the soldiers. That's a huge thing I miss. And, um, and I think that's good, you know, um, but I still develop in those relationships. Absolutely. Yeah. It. I think, uh, again, something that helped me going from the pace of everything to retirement was the la that last job that I was in up at uh, Army Special Operations Headquarters. Office job, very light hours, very light workload. I was not in charge, so I was not managing, you know, 140 students or soldiers or anything like that. So going from being a first sergeant and all the stuff that you juggle with that, or like a command sergeant major or whatever, to having this job for my last, which is kind of why uh, we had talked about while I was working for you, it's kind of the reason I wanted to take that job as well. Yeah. But it kind of allowed me that that kind of ramp down. But, but yeah, it was the same. It, what you described was a lot the same for me as far as the the pace and everything changing now you got to find your new structure what's your new mission uh, missing some of the guys a little bit uh, but not missing the bureaucracy and stuff and you know I, the other thing that you didn't mention that kind of was something that I think affected me a bit was uh, there was no more adrenaline rush I didn't have and I could have put that in my life I could have done you know skydiving or you know, whitewater kayak and was something I looked at, but never did, you know, things like that. I could have put that adrenaline back in my life, but I wasn't jumping out of airplanes anymore. You know, wasn't doing the things that we do in the military that provide yeah. you that, that rush and whatnot. And so that was, uh, other than the things you mentioned, that was something that I, that I missed as well. But all right. So, so you've got, so you got your master's program going on. So to, to caveat this, which caveat is a, well-used military word there, but to caveat this, we're going to, I want, Pat, I want you to talk about the white belt mindset, which is your blog. But for the listeners, I want you to understand, we're not going to go real deep with this. I'm going to post the link in the show notes 
and I would love for you to go read the blog, go check it out because there's some really great stuff in there that, that Pat learned through this journey. Uh, so Pat, tell us, tell us about the white belt mindset. It's a mindset that I embrace and, and, and your listeners may ask why white belt, why not black belt? When I was growing up uh, in Japan and came to the States, I, I was involved in the dojo, uh, both judo and karate. And, uh, you know, as, as, a, as a beginner, you look at the black belts and you're like, okay, that's my goal. I had a sensei explain to me that black belt is only halfway point. And, you know, you, you put in the work, the training, and as a white belt and through all the, the sweat, the blood, the tears, that white belt starts to discolor and you gain experiences and it becomes black. And you continue training and those black threads start coming apart. And, you know, as you continue that blood, sweat, and tears and hard training. And so it's circular. You start white belt and you go all the way. And so for me, it was that approach to learning, uh, approach, <clears throat> excuse me, to pursuing something. I didn't want to stop at black at a black belt. That's only halfway. So I, I used that mindset in what I was pursuing. I had also been a command sergeant major, as we've explained, and I looked at that as a halfway point. Some to some folks, that's a pinnacle of a enlisted soldier's career. Certainly. So that for me was halfway point because there's still life to pursue. So uh, as I continued in my uh, master's program and looked at what I want to do postgraduate studies, you know, it is that approach. Do I have all the answers? Do I know everything? I have a plan. Plan hasn't all come to fruition, but it keeps me driving. It checks me, holds me accountable. So that's the idea behind white belt mindset and you know through the program I did um, some research and training uh, in Japan earlier this year between January and February and my approach to that was exactly white belt mindset. I wanted to test the skills and the theories that I was being exposed to in the academic realm and some that I was exposed to as a professional as a special forces soldier and test them in a new environment. I decided to go back to Japan, go to a dojo in an art that I had no experience with. Start from the beginning. I wanted to see what it was gonna be like for me to be a brand new guy at 51 years old, being smoked, being you know responsible for cleaning, all those factors. In one way, I looked at, could a command sergeant major go back to basic training and do private E1 stuff? And so that was the idea behind all this. And I was able to, um, to go to Japan and, and, and see all that come to fruition. Incredible experience. Personally, professionally, uh, lots of lessons that I will continue to tap into for the rest of my life. So for the listener, you studied kendo, correct? So, so if you would just kind of give the listeners just a little quick description of what kendo is so they understand. Sure. So I studied kendo and part of that, I studied, also studied EI though since it was being offered. Kendo is the art of sword fighting. Obviously fighting with swords and, and with the actual sword uh, would not end well for either you know, the, the opponent or yourself. So Kendo, some folks may have seen you're wearing the armor, you're wearing a uh, head protection, and it's bamboo uh, shinai, which is, you know, the ba bamboo katana. Still hurts, I tell you, it still hurts. <laughs> with the equipment, there were so many times my forearms, my ribs, and, and, and you go full speed. And, and these folks in Japan did not take it easy on me, and that's what I wanted. I didn't want to be... A hey, command sergeant major retired, Pat. We have a lot of respect for you. We're going to take it easy. None of these folks knew me, knew my background, and they went all out, and it was great. So kendo is a more of a sport, um, but it uses aspects of sword fighting. Then the Iaido part of my training was actually using the katana, 
obviously you're not attacking somebody, but you're going through the mindset, the preparation, the application. For those folks that are shooters out there, imagine doing a lot of dry firing and, and you know, going through the mechanics of putting lead on target. And so that's what we did with the katana. So all that was both mentally and physically rewarding. Would it be fair to say that there were points where you got your butt whooped? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. My little guys, you know, I'm a big dude. Uh, <laughs> I'm a bigger dude when I'm in Japan. <laughs> now, now I had, I had good experiences with you working for you, but it's probably safe to say there's, there's probably some people that worked for you at some point that would have jo- enjoyed seeing you get your butt whooped by some little dudes. Oh yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure. And, and hopefully some of the videos I posted on the blog showed that aspect or some of the words I wanted to say, Hey, as a white belt, I thought I had some skills. I, I definitely had experienced combat. So attacking or engaging an enemy uh, was something I welcomed. But some of these guys that were five foot four that were quick as lightning have, have been doing this since they were young, you know, maybe so some of them at the age of eight. And they're coming at me full speed, aggression, intensity, and cracking me in the, in, in the head, even though I'm wearing a helmet. Um, there's a couple of times that, that my, my head wrong. And uh, <laughs> it, but it was incredible. Yeah, I got whipped up. And, and, you know, there was female practitioners out there. They didn't take a light. Now, I was told that I held my ground as a beginner um, because, you know, yeah, part of that, I'm stupid. I, I like to engage pain. I like to get close, and I'm not going to back down. And, but there was times, man, I was cracked in the head, cracked in the ribs. I left marks and welts. But it was great. <laughs> so, so this is sword fighting. So, I mean, those cracks in the head and ribs could could potentially be life enders right there for real, right? Because, and when I listen to you talk about this, and then reading about it as well, uh, I think about the knife training, you know, knife combat that we yeah. learned uh, in the military, and then knife training that I've done outside the military as well. The one thing that I come away with from from any knife training I've ever done is that. I don't ever want to be in a knife fight ever. Sure. Would you say the same as far as a sword? Yeah. So, you know, know, because we're using bamboo shinai or the the bamboo, you know, sword, uh, you're not going to get cut, but you're going to get well. But it is the idea of a head strike, a wrist strike, a strike to the throat, a strike to the, to the, to the body. Uh, It's intent is to, you know, deal death to your opponent or put your opponent out. So in that kendo realm, uh, you're practicing those strikes, and that's why I say it's it's uh, considered a sport. But when we did the katana, it allowed me to figure or picture some of the strikes that I was learning in kendo and applying them and think, you know, if, if I did this strike, it, it certainly would sever the head or the midsection. Um, I, I enjoyed it. it probably come across in, in my uh as I articulated just tremendous time Chad and I, you know it's something I enjoyed and um passion of mine as far as developing learning and the whole beginner uh mindset environment man it just fueled me but it wore me out I mean I was in I had muscles that that hurt that hadn't hurt in years um there was there's some things I'm, you know, went through my head, man, I'm, I'm too old for this in the sense, not age wise, but my, my, my knees didn't work like they did when we were in our twenties, you know, 31 years of being on jump status. Uh, my ankles and knees didn't, you know, react as quick as I wanted to, but I had to learn in my present state, my present, present condition. How do I deal with that? Okay. I'm not as fast as I used to be. So I need to work on my strike or my awareness, my defense. And so that was the, the mental challenges or mental condition that was taking place along with all the other things I was learning. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's so neat to read about and everything because it's, uh, I mean, the journey, it's such a cool journey. I mean, it, uh, to, to, for you to go back to Japan, to, to get into this art that you hadn't really studied before, I mean, it's, it's super neat. So again, 
I know I've said it a few times now, but go, go check out Pat's blog. I'll provide the links. Definitely go read it. It's, it's neat. It's, it's not real long. You know I mean? It's, it's very, it's well-written. It's, it's not real long. So if you want to sit down and read every article at once, yeah, it'll take you a while, but it's, it's, it's a, it's a good read. What, what, um, what rank did you, did, so I, so remember reading you, you ranked up. So, so what rank did you, how many, let's say this, how many ranks did you progress through by yeah. the time you were done? So part of my preparation going into this, I wanted to truly go in there as a beginner. So I had this equipment because there's a lot of equipment and it's very formal on how you dial your equipment. Imagine putting your kid on at the fire base. Well, there's a set procedure. You're, you're in a kneeling position as you do certain things. Uh, how you lay the equipment out, it is very, very deliberate and formal. I knew none of that. So my expectation going into this was just to soak this all up. And no intention or goal of being tested. I was only going to be there six weeks. Realistically, for me to even go in there saying, hey, I want to test to a certain rank would be idiotic. So I, that was even on the, on the table for me. They approached me based on the progress and all that. So my very last session there, they told me a, a couple of weeks prior, we're going to test you. And it was great for me because here I am in front of the entire dojo being tested um, in all the, the training of the actual katana. On the kendo aspect, uh, I'm being tested and observed, and I had this spar against the top guy there, and he went all out on me. I mean, I was winded. I was hurting. Just holding the, the shinai up in the, in the proper form, I, I was spent. But at the end of the, the day, they uh, promoted me to, you know, so Don level is a black belt level. So I would, no way I would have been tested for that. But I am one step below from tested from black belt. So another year of training. So in Kendo, I skipped several ranks and uh, in the Q realm. So just still below the black belt. And in the idol, the art of drawing the actual katana, um, I'm, I'm still two levels away, probably a couple years time-wise as far as training before I'm eligible for a black belt. Um, for me, I liked uh, Mr. Miyagi's saying in uh, the Karate Kid, you know, black belt, you could go to Sears and get it. It's more of, you know, it is a representation and, and certainly for practitioners, it is a goal. But my approach to it is, you know, black belt, white belt, whatever color belt. I just want to. I just want to grow. I want to pursue. I want to be the best version of me and continue to to develop in this art. Gotcha. I mean, that's that's awesome. Uh, again, such a cool story. So we're gonna try to uh, get towards wrapping up here. I know if you've listened to our other shows that uh, Pat and I can can go on for for a good while. We've we've overshot our mark on on every podcast but i feel like the content has been has been great um and that's why i've had pat on for now his third time and you'll be back on again because uh we're talking about transition but i mean you're i mean you're you're still young in this transition right now. i mean you're over a little over two years in right so uh, just like me we we retired just really like a month apart so I'm going to hold you to coming back on um, if for nothing else, just to talk about transition, maybe a year from now or something. And, sure. and, and let's see, see how things are progressed, get some lessons out of that as well. Uh, so any, any closing thoughts on, on the transition process and what we've talked about? Yeah. You know, just for the folks out there that are getting ready to transition or maybe you recently transitioned. When we're in the military, we understood the idea of team and we rarely went out there on a mission by ourselves. Uh, if we did, we were probably in the wrong. It was a team mindset. We also had support when we went out on patrols or went out and did a mission. I would encourage listeners out there that are in that realm of transitioning to apply a team mindset. You got folks like Chad, 
uh, with his podcast. You can contact him direct. He's had guests on his show that have gone through this process. Count us as being part of your team. Just because it worked for me, it may not work exactly the same for you. But in communicating and sharing those experiences, you might find the answer for you. And that's what we're here for. For those that are well into this process, Chad and I, a couple of years, um, yeah, embrace the fact that we're in the military. I love serving this nation. I love the people that this nation produced. But that was in the past for me. And I can't drive looking at my rear view mirror. Yes, I reminisce quite a bit. But what is it that's going to take you forward? And again, count on the team. If you're struggling with that, and a lot of folks do struggle as they make the transition, reach out. You got to take that step. We are here for you. We say that all often. But you got to take that, that, that initial step of reaching out. So we're here for you. And um, certainly want to come team up with any, any of the folks out there. Whether I serve with you or not, um, I'd be more than glad to, to help out. Yeah. Uh, to, to back what Pat said, reach out to us. And if you're asking for transition advice, looking for a path, you know, talk to more than one person as well. Don't just talk to one person. I mean, you may have one person that's been your mentor or whatever throughout everything that's worked for you. I got it. Talk to them, but talk to other people as well. Because like Pat said, you know, all paths are not the same and not all paths will work uh, for, for you. So make sure that, make sure that you get multiple streams of advice. 100%. Coming to you. 100%, Chad. Yeah. I mean, it, it's, it, it helped me throughout my career to talk to more than one person. It's just like going to a doctor. If you got something serious coming, you want to try to get uh, more than one, uh, more than one diagnosis if you can, or get a backup as well. So, so great advice, Pat. I mean, I think uh, there, there's a lot that folks can get out of this, but again, if you got any questions or whatever, reach out to us. We're still part of a team. We still continue to serve. We, we were in for 20 years plus because we had a mindset of serving taking care of others and, and all those things. So that doesn't stop. So take care of each other. If you're a veteran out there, reach out, reach out to others around you. If you know somebody that's going to go through the process and uh, even if they don't want to hear, force them to hear your lessons learned so that, so that you can help them out. Sure, right, can, Pat, I, can I offer yeah. one more thing too? And this goes out to the folks that may not have served in the army. This is open to the Navy, Marine Corps, Air Force, Coast Guard, I would tell you, I've developed a network, and I think most people have, that span the different components. So don't be intimidated because I was an Army dude or Chad was an Army dude. Reach out. Yeah, ab absolutely. It, it's, it's all, I mean, because what really matters is not what was prior to your time getting out. I mean, some of that plays into what you'll do after, but for the most part, it's the transition process forward that you need to help with or, or that you can get the assistant with. So what you did prior, we can talk about that. So like Pat said, whatever service you were in, Pat, it's, it's been great talking to you again. Again, I, uh, I'd like to, I'd like to come back and revisit. I don't know. I'm just throwing an arbitrary number out there, but a year from now, whatever, um, and talk about where you're at. Something may happen between now and then that warrants coming back and talking about it. And we can certainly, do that and 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 as much as we uh as much as we like to talk and deliberate on stuff there could be another topic that comes up so don't be surprised if you see pat between now and then talking about something besides transition but pat has been great i'm i'm proud to have you as part of my network of folks that i can look to as well um, because you no matter how good or how smart you think you are you can always use a coach a mentor a friend a brainstorming partner whatever you call it so, so make sure you keep those relationships up and they'll benefit you much like this relationship is benefiting me and hopefully benefiting you all. So Appreciate Pat, thanks. Time, Chad. Thank you for having me. All right. So folks look for the show notes, check out the show notes, the comments, wherever this is posted, it'll be on YouTube, iTunes, all your platforms. And I will have the links to Pat's blog and contact information and all that so that 
we can follow through if you need any assistance. Thanks folks and have a good one.